So thinking about implementation generally, what, what is implementation? Again, today I'm just using the term as a construct to describe a lot of different types, but it is research that addresses complex, real-world variables in practice settings. And it does that by research that investigates barriers and solutions for the delivery of sustainable, effective protocols that will maximize outcomes for a large number of consumers. It also is research that includes stakeholders. And when I talk about stakeholders, I'm talking about practitioners, clients, caregivers, administrators, all of the stakeholders in that uh, um, protocol that's uh, being delivered. And also, the other, ver the other uh, characteristic of implementation science is that it actively integrates research and practice, actively, all along. And that, that's um, a slightly different model than talking about efficacy to um, implementation. So implementation is about how do you move evidence into practice or how do you find evidence in practice? So thinking about those in both ways. So how have we been doing in our discipline? Where are we in our discipline? So uh, my colleague Barbane and I uh, looked at, reviewed some journals since, some journals, our ASHA journals from 2006 to 2012, and we just broke them up into these categories. So we have total number of articles, um, then we have total number and percent of treatment articles, and you can see over these years that we have out of 1,025 articles, these, by the way, didn't include letters to the editor, these were research articles. Out of 1,025, we had 109 that looked at treatment. So only 11% in our own journals. What percent of the treatment looked at efficacy? Well, we're doing pretty good. So those of us who've been doing research looking at intervention, treatment in these data, 57% um, were about efficacy. Not so good moving along the pipeline into effectiveness and implementation. Only 24 articles out of the 109 tackled that, so 22%. So as a discipline, we're not really doing a lot of implementation, effectiveness implementation. And if we're going to respond to the needs in healthcare and education and this new need to do business differently, we have to begin thinking about that. So this is just a little preach here, I'm preaching that we really have to start thinking about a different way, a different way to think about our research. And maybe not different, an expanded way, because we're not throwing out the efficacy, but we've got to expand. So let me move on to my talk, my part about this, and that is the applied researcher's perspective. So I came back to get into research as an SLP. I was a practicing clinician. And um, I was working in early intervention. And what drove me back and what drove me to do research was, was these, this basic question, am I making a difference? And with babies, young children, I was working with toddlers, uh, young children, I was thinking, so what's my work and what's maturation? And that's just what drove me back to begin thinking about research. And so my research always has this as its goal, my personal research and my lab's research, and my doctoral student's research. <laughs> so, so what did I want to know? I wanted to have evidence about what to treat. What is, how do you pick your treatment objectives? There should be evidence for that that you can collect. When to treat, and then how long to treat. And so those are the basic questions as applied researcher that I wanted to ask. So um, I want to tell you, uh, use myself and, and one part of my research as an example to illustrate you, to you the issue that I'm uh, confronting right now about implementation and uh, what I'm thinking about and um, what my lab's thinking about. So I say here, here's my research story, but it is really my uh, UW um, team, T 
TG stands for triadic gaze, and I'll talk to you about that. Uh, Pat Dowden, Gaylord Pinder, Julie Firestein, and Catherine Greenslade, that we've been working on these questions for many years, so I want to talk to you about that. So in moving from efficacy to implementation, we've been studying a short-term in intensive treatment designed to teach triadic eye gaze, TG, uh, to young children with severe uh, physical disabilities. And triadic eye gaze is looking at uh, a person and to an object and back to the person. That connection that has been shown in the literature to be a hallmark of intentional communication, linking together the object and the person. And so uh, we've been embarking on this research to look at a particular treatment that we developed and to, to take it through this research uh, pipeline, the traditional research continuum. So it started in the 1990s. Um, we did uh, two feasibility, feasibility studies in the 1990s. One, the first one was a time series single case uh, ABA multiple baseline across context study. And yes, we showed our treatment did create change. It was very promising. This was a, a work with Gayloid Pender and Kathleen Coggins. We went on to do another feasibi feasibility study. This one was a little more sophisticated. Uh, it was a time series study, ABA multiple baseline across context, but now we're replicating it across three children. And again, these are children with severe disabilities. Um, these are children who are characterized by sensory, motor, perhaps cognitive uh, deficits, cerebral palsy, um, Down syndrome, other syndromes. So these are very severely impaired babies. With all of these studies, uh, these feasibility, feasibility studies, we had a single SLP who was delivering the service. It was a child-focused treatment directly to the child caregivers observed. Um, it was two times a week for 15 weeks. It was in the clinic. We had outcome measures one time a week. Efficacy research and uh, systematic, well-controlled, and saw nice responses to the treatment and replicated across the three children. We then went on to do another feasibility study, and this feasibility study was another time series, um, multiple baseline say, but this was across caregivers. We wanted to see if the caregivers were involved in delivering this treatment, how did they do? Um, there was one SLP, but this time the SLP is treating the caregiver, not the child. Um, two times a week for, this was a uh, controlled length, three weeks, and we had outcome measures. And this study showed that we could teach caregivers part of the protocol. We were really successful with part of the protocol, but not all the protocol, which was interesting. And the children responded to the parents, and the children showed some change, but not as much change as when the SLP delivered the protocol. So here we are, three studies done in the 1990s and um, into the early 2000s. And we're having good evidence to show to continue this path of research. So then we were fortunate to be involved with a program project with uh, folks at the University of Kansas. And um, we were able to do, uh, conduct a randomized control study. This was done through 2006 to 2012. I just wanted to put here that um, we had 46 children and families who consented. But ultimately, we had 18 children who met our criteria, who were able to stay in the study, whose parents were able to stay in the study. So this is not easy research to do. And, and already now we've, we've got it over a decade of, of work that we've done. So we had uh, nine children in our experimental group and uh, nine children in our control group. The experimental group got our triadic gaze treatment that focused intensive treatment given by the SLP plus their standard of care and the control group got only their standard of care. Now we have three different clinicians, so we've, we've trained a variety of clinicians. We're expanding our study and into something that's look more like effectiveness, moving down this pipeline. Um, we also have a different SLP collecting the measurements and the treatment was done in the homes but still t twice a week. Um, for 16 weeks. 
And as with the um, feasibility studies, we found very promising results. We had greater changes in our control group than, I mean, our experimental group than our control group. And so we, we have identified a treatment that is showing great promise. And we're eager now to begin thinking about how do we get this out there? How do we begin thinking about how treatment might change for birth to three, children in uh, this young age group? So again, these are babies, 10 to 24 months. I'm not sure I said that it was on the slide, but 10 to 24 months seen in birth to three centers. And it's a model that is a little different than what is often done in birth to three, because right now in birth to three, through the Education for All Act, there's a lot of naturalistic, there's a lot of coaching that's being done, and we're advocating, and we've demonstrated the effects of a SLP-delivered, child-focused intensive treatment. And our belief is that this intensive treatment to teach uh, intentional communication through eye gaze can kickstart the child into moving forward. So we're advocating a service delivery model that's a little different, and a treatment that's a little different, uh, because oftentimes with the babies with physical disabilities, the SLP is not the primary service provider, but the PT and the OT. So a lot is, could be different, and that's where we are faced now with our challenge. How do we move this into practice? How do we move it into birth to three centers? So the challenges are, to name a few, I can only name a few right today, Understanding the intricacies of service delivery, birth to three centers. So including, these are some of the challenges and the intricacies, the needs and priorities of the uh, stakeholders. That is the organization, the administrators, the practitioners, the children, and the families. So here we have this really good protocol, and here we have the birth to three centers, and what are their needs and priorities? Um, the constraints of the real world logistics that um, might influence how we train. So we have a nice protocol, but now we need to train practitioners. What are the constraints for implementing that? Um, then we wish to get, of course, implementation fidelity, having it done the way we've been doing it, and sustainability or stability over time, but all in this new context. And um, outcome measures. What are the appropriate outcome measures? And um, are they sensitive to different phases of implementation and different stakeholders? So the whole world of research is a different, it's got a different look to it for me. So these are, my, these are the questions that our team has been uh, thinking about. Can the treatment be implemented as designed? Uh, what adaptations need to be made for the birth to three center? What type and degree of training are required? Which, what kind of training works best in, in the uh, needs of the birth to three center? And does buy-in, how does buy-in of practitioners, administrators influence the outcomes? Are they equally as excited to have our protocol as we are to share our protocol? So those are some of the questions. We are moving forward with this effort. And um, I want to leave you on my part with this, the, the challenge and the thoughts that I have, and that is um, moving into practice is every bit as scientific as efficacy research. And there are variables to control, there are variables to investigate. You can't just write your article, you can't just give a workshop. There is more to it. There's something more proactive in terms of the research that you're doing to prove and to demonstrate that you can do this with fidelity and sustainability. And um, what I want to leave you with is this question that keeps sort of haunting me and that's prompted me to be an advocate of implementation science and to begin thinking about it and having our doctoral students think about it, our new investigators think about it, and that's this question. If I would have been thinking about implementation when I designed my first feasibility study, or my second, would I have designed it the same way? Or would I have had 
my stakeholders be more involved? Because right now, I still have this gap between our treatment protocol and implementing it to birth to three. So this question is what's really prompted me to be excited about having myself and our team and everyone in this room think about implementation science earlier rather than later. <laughs>